Eleanor Williams' claims that she'd been trafficked by an Asian grooming gang led to protests, racist attacks, and claims of a cover-up. Eventually, she was jailed for lying. I don't want to be that girl that cries rape. I'm not that person. I'm Sky News' Jason Farrell, and in Unreliable Witness, we ask, why did she lie? And explore unanswered questions with new revelations. Follow Unreliable Witness wherever you get your podcasts. Ruth's in the hot seat. I'm a yeah, bit yeah. jealous of you sitting there. <laughs> Love it. Stretching right out. <laughs> right, you ready? Let's do it. Yep. Hello, this is Beth and I am not in Westminster. I'm at Centre Parks with four 12-year-olds. It's the final day, thank the Lord. Jess, where are you? I'm in Birmingham. I think I'm also with four teenagers of varying varieties. Ruth, where are you? I am in London. I have escaped from my small child. This is the first two-week holiday I've had since he started school and left nursery and oh my god what a shock to the system of having to fill a fortnight <laughs> of Easter holidays <laughs> with a five-year-old This is electoral dysfunction now it may be recess in Westminster but we are back in business coming up. Jess is going to tell us how the Westminster honey trap plots going down with MPs Ruth wants to talk about some big poll leads for Labour and how it could actually do some good for the Tories. Counterintuitive, I'm interested in that. Plus, what we're making about the claims about Angela Rayner's tax. What are the politics of this? And are voters taking much notice anyway? And we've got more messages coming up too. And if you're liking all of this, follow us, tell your mates and leave us a review. So we're almost done with Easter recess. Did we get a rest from politics? Conservative William Ragg didn't. I think we can say he's had a dysfunctional week. He's given up the Tory whip after admitting he shared MPs and journalists' phone numbers. He says he handed them over to someone who had compromising things on him. He's now sitting as an independent MP. Look, this has all happened while uh, politicians are away uh, from Westminster. But Jess, how's it going down with MPs? Have you heard much from the speaker about it for a start. There is quite a lot of members of parliament sort of jokingly saying they feel a bit left out that they've not been targeted because quite a lot of lobby journalists, I think, Beth, were also targeted. Yeah, and Harry York at the Sunday Times wrote a big piece on it and I think Henry Zeffman at the BBC has also talked about how he was targeted. Jess, what were they trying to find out if you've been targeted? Do you know anyone that was targeted? They were trying to ascertain and just just encouraging people to come forward if anybody had been targeted. I actually don't know. None of my sort of close Westminster friends have been targeted, either gay men or heterosexual men, which seems to be the two different uh, prongs of the attack. What I loved about the journalist stuff, because I've been watching all the kind of coverage on Twitter and, and social media, is there seems to be a significant number of lobby journalists that are a bit put out that they weren't targeted. So I put on Twitter that, like, it isn't necessarily the bit of the story where William Rank gives out information on Grinder. It's the bit of the story where a complete stranger gets in touch with you via WhatsApp Uh, And within 10 messages, you've sent them a picture of your privates that I I literally cannot fathom. I've written about this before, about how politics attracts the kind of people who are thrilled by risk. I can only assume that they sort of knew how fucking ridiculous it was to send a picture of their dicks, basically, to a total stranger... It must have been the risk of that. Now, as a member of parliament, I'm anxious about people taking photos of me in a group in case there's somebody who's, I don't know, said off-colour things on Twitter once is in the photo with me. So it's a good trap because certainly, A, sex and men, so tick that off, but also Westminster, you know, if your job is to basically do a a job interview in front of 100,000 people and be told whether you're going to get that job or not, on the national news, you are the kind of person who is thrilled by risk and chase. Um, And so it doesn't surprise me that this was uh, a method, whoever has done it, 
that they would use. I don't, I don't think that is fair for all politicians that they're obsessed with risk. But I do think that this is, I mean, very clearly gendered because I don't know a single woman that would have a conversation with somebody they'd never met and be encouraged to send a, a picture of their privates and send it. Apparently, sending a nude. A lot of gay people have been in touch with me this week, uh, young men who I've uh, worked with over the years and said, oh, sending a nude on Grinder is like saying hello. So that's absolutely fine. But the misunderstanding of female sexuality to the point where you think that a woman would be soliciting a picture of your penis for their own pleasure is such a blatant misunderstanding of female sexuality. We're all sitting here genuinely astonished that someone uh, would think that was a good idea. As an MP, right, I mean, it's hardly believable, but it has happened and apparently, from what I was reading, a couple of others have also apparently sent images, so it's not just one MP that sent images. But the second thing is the sort of political handling of it by the government. I mean, I unsolicited because I'm off, so I'm not sort of WhatsApping everyone this week, but uh, a former cabinet minister got in touch with me after RAG withdrew himself from the whip. So he resigned the whip. The party didn't withdraw the whip. He resigned it himself Uh, Someone messaged me, and Ruth, I want to ask you about this. He said um, number 10 shouldn't have defended him and called his apology courageous. It wasn't. He confessed because he was about to be outed. That he sent a picture and gave out personal details. Neither of it acceptable. Anyone else would be suspended at the least. There should have been proper swift action. And this person goes on to say, our leadership decided to defend him. If it wasn't so stupid, it would be genuinely funny. The script of the thick of it stuff. A few of us messaged the centre at the weekend to say, what the F? The resignation was inevitable. Ruth? I'm I'm just trying to work out which ex-cabinet minister that is, and I think I've got a pretty good idea just by the language that you've read out there. I I would never reveal my sources. (laughs) The thing is, though, uh, Ruth, what do you think about the handling of it? And is there more going on as to why they haven't gone in so hard on William Ragg? Yeah, well, there's there's a couple of things that are quite interesting here. One is that the security services seem to be shrugging their shoulders. So I I think there's clearly an understanding somewhere along the line, even though it's not been said, that this is a kind of lone actor agent rather than this is a, you know, a nefarious plot by a foreign power of, of some kind. It just, it seems like an odd response. Like it seems a little bit counterfactual the way the response has worked. Uh, and, I, and I don't kind of get why. I mean, courageous is such an odd word to use when the man himself apologised for. And I, I thought his apology was pretty honest sounding and pretty fulsome actually saying you know I was weak I was scared uh, and that's why I handed it over but I've put other people at risk and that's not acceptable he's right it's completely unacceptable at least he recognises that and I'm sure it's a a horrible horrible situation to find yourself in and I was on a different radio show uh, that that I present talking to a panel of journalists about this and, and one of them as well as doing a lot of politics coverage, likes covering crime and does a lot of court reporting and has covered kind of romance frauds and stuff like that before. And she was saying the kind of empathy that you need for people that get tangled into some of these really webs and, and how they feel they can't get out of it. And and she did make me think about it another way. But, but again, this comes down to, you know, this is somebody in an important job who has responsibilities and they have responsibilities to not just the job they have, but the place in which they work and the people with whom they work. And, you know, the idea that he threw all of that out the window is so willfully irresponsible that actually I don't I don't think that that level of understanding or acceptance or excuse that the government made on his behalf, you know, I, I think it's bad judgment. I think this is another one where you, you, you look at the judgment of the Prime Minister and go, this doesn't fly. I wonder too also, the apology he gave, he obviously feels completely wretched about the whole thing. There is an element, as you said, Jess, of of him actually being a, a victim of a sting, if you like. But he is a hypocrite, though, because he was a moralizer. That's the thing as well. Like Some of the stuff that he physically has said, lots of other MPs haven't said about how you should conduct yourself, what happens in relationships, like all that sort of stuff. I just wonder whether there's a sort of duty of care element to this at the moment and that he seems like he's quite vulnerable 
Um, maybe they're trying to protect him a bit. I don't know. Of course, there is a duty of care and there is a duty of care to William Rag by Parliament as well as the Conservative Party. And he must feel wretched and nobody likes being in the eye of the storm, especially about something embarrassing. But he should have. Like, you know, the, the compromising video or whatever it was that was going to be released. To be honest, like, it might be embarrassing, but unless it involves drugs or exploitation of some variety, what's compromising about it? Like, it's consenting adults and it wouldn't have been printed in the vast majority of news sources. And I know that doesn't make any difference because it would just end up on the internet now. But you're right, it's not Keith Farz. It's not got cocaine in it. It's not paying somebody. It's not illegal. Exactly. So you're consenting adults and it might be embarrassing and you shouldn't have allowed someone to film you and all that jazz that I spend, I go around schools talking to kids about. But the self-preservation in the moment of frantic fear... I, I get it and I feel some sympathy for him, but I'm afraid to say it doesn't justify it. No, and if you don't want to feel like that, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There's, there's a really, I mean, I sound like I'm a moraliser here and I, I've never really thought of myself as such, but just don't put yourself in a position. From what you've had from the Speaker, etc., do you think Parliament is now alive to this new risk or this emerging risk and also the dishing out of phone numbers? Yeah, yeah, I imagine that there will be some sort of uh, specific response. I mean, post the Chinese issue, which we discussed before uh, recess, the the issue of China hacking into emails and phones and things, we were already all being asked to go to like specific security things to have our phones checked. The trouble is, is that I think people think that we have parliamentary phones. And we don't. I just have a phone. It is my personal phone. And I have to say, I am way more careful about my parliamentary computer, for example, and the iPad they give me. But my phone is just my phone. So I I imagine what will come of this is probably that we all have to have parliamentary issued phones that are locked down by the security services. And and that's where I imagine this is going. We got a lovely email from the Lord Speaker going, no, no. Nobody's actually targeted any lords in any of this. But but if you do have concerns, nobody, nobody's been after you. Nobody's been after you to put out. But if you do have concerns, here's a top tips booklet on how to use a mobile phone. It's available here. That I genuinely, I've got it in front of me. And if you are worried about your security, there's an email address and bless them, they've tried to make it easy for us. Like caps lock, the like, the thing that you might want to put in at parliament.uk. And it's just, I was like, it was it was like, oh, bless, bless. <laughs> but there's also a serious thing here, which is like, ours is a contact business. It's about having a contact book, having people's phone numbers. You're on WhatsApp groups where all these MPs that many members of the public would want to get to, and they become a currency, don't they, Jess? I mean, were you surprised about that, that he'd given people's numbers out? Well, I'm actually not surprised because people do it all the time. You're absolutely right. Having people's phone numbers is a massive currency in Westminster. People give out people's phone numbers in order to curry and lobby and and variously. Like that happens all the time in Westminster. There's one thing like somebody texting you and saying, oh, have you got so-and-so's phone number? There is another thing on Grindr being asked for what seems like a list of people's phone numbers. You know, that those two things are different, but you're absolutely right. It is a known currency to have a good contact book in politics. Now, very much top of the polls is Labour. They've had a couple of big leads. The first by Servation and based on a 15,000 strong sample forecast a Labour majority of 286, 107 more even than the 1997 Blair landslide. Another put the majority at 154. Both polls are using a system called MRP, which I'll explain a bit. It basically takes polling data, adds other details about people such as age, qualifications, income. Now, the method first came to prominence in 2017 because YouGov used MRP uh, to accurately forecast the 2017 hung parliament. So, People put quite a lot of stock into MRP, which we can get onto in a minute. But, you know, for Labour, this is like their worst nightmare in the sense that when you talk to people at Lotto, that's the Labour leader's office, the sort of HQ of the Starmer operation, they are currently waging a war against complacency, as someone put it to me the other day. Ruth, you reckon it helps the Tories all of this? 
Talk us through that. The polling lead has been so consistent for Labour and it's been for such a long time that actually it is not unhelpful for the general public to think that this election, whenever it comes, is already a done deal. I mean, I think for Conservatives, there's a lot of people that have got their head around the fact that they will no longer be the government after the next election. But it's there's a big difference between losing an election and having a catastrophic defeat that it takes you three elections to come back from. There's a huge difference. So the idea that the entire country thinks that Labour's going to win at a canter, don't need to break sweats, they can vote for the Greens or the Libs or they can register a protest vote. Actually, that's not unhelpful for the Tories. And also it helps lay the groundwork because quite a lot of what happens, particularly on election night and in the immediate nights after and how you frame a new government coming in is how well they did. And if the expectation level is high and Keir Starmer fails to reach it, that comes back to the idea that he's a bit underpowered, he's uh, a bit underperforming. These are all accusations that are currently levelled at him. And if the expectation is he's going to have a 250 majority and he only comes in with a 100 majority, I mean, a 100 majority for an incoming Labour government would be enormous in historical terms, but it wouldn't be portrayed as such on, on the news and it wouldn't frame his early days. And Jess, give us a bit of a chat about MRP, how it puts a a different slant on things. How do these polls help us? I mean, funny enough, the MRP, because it's such a, a, firstly, a, a massive big sample size. So first and foremost, it's interesting on that basis because most polling charts people's changes within a very small group. And so it's interesting to go outside of that. But also it gets down to a granular level on constituency basis. So one of the MRPs that came out last week was by Best for Britain, whose whole sort of gig is like looking at tactical voting and alliances that form uh, and how you achieve that. And so in both the MRPs that happened last week, I have been approached by the people who did them to look at exactly what it meant in my constituency. I have to say, when it gets down to that granular level, it is interesting and it's about tactical voting and squeeze messaging is what we call that in politics. So if you think you're going to lose votes to the Greens, you'd have a specific squeeze message or to the Tories or whatever. Basically, the Lib Dem bar chart is always a squeeze message. And uh, when people say it's a two horse race here, that's squeeze messaging. Hilariously, my Lib Dem came third in what he kept describing as a two horse race. So I did enjoy uh, one thing it doesn't do well actually is look at ethnic minority voting of which in my constituency is the minority by only a tiny fraction so I think that there are still flaws in it but but Ruth is exactly right in her analysis that it's a squeeze messages delight an MRP poll that basically makes out like the Labour Party can put their feet up and not do any work and we're still going to win and bear in mind that the Labour Party now, uh, over the last sort of 10, 15, 20 years, has become much more sort of city intelligentsia based, if you will, like university towns and things. In those places, you know, there is a real risk that, oh, well, the Labour Party is going to win, so we'll vote green or we'll we'll vote, or, or in places like, I hate the term because, you know, as somebody who lives in it, the Red Wall, the likelihood is that they will go, oh, well, we can vote reform to kick the Tories in their eye. The idea that you have a massive poll lead and you're probably about to win a general election, this becomes a problem. It does seem counterintuitive, but... It's been really interesting the past couple of weeks because as Labour launched their local election campaign, they have been telling everyone that they can and in the around the leader's office, Morgan McSweeney, who's the campaign chief, who Jess, I'm sure you know very well indeed. You know, I think he went to Shadow Cabinet the other day armed with charts showing various different parties at different points in different parts of the world, having massive poll leads and then losing massive poll leads. So there was Germany in 2021, where the SPD was third for 46 consecutive months, and then they went first. Norway 2017, Labour had a massive poll lead there, and then they rose people's taxes and they lost. He had loads of examples, and uh, as I understand it, kind of ran through this with the shadow cat, he's probably given this presentation to anyone he can get his hands on. I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I, I really like Morgan, but what I would say about him is that if you were to go to him with a problem, he would come back to you with the data from other countries before he helped you. <laughs> <laughs> but the point, the point, the point of all of it is one shadow cabinet 
minister who I had lunch with the other day sort of said, we're in this weird world through the looking glass where this general election has suddenly become or turning into a referendum on the Labour Party when they're in opposition. And the way the Conservatives are beginning to try and run the campaign is that they are like they're the challenge of Bram because there's this kind of sense of inevitability of a of a Labour government. And, you know, when I put this to people in, you know, HQ around Starmer, I mean, they obviously absolutely hate it. And what they're saying is like they have got to try and motivate the party to go out every day to keep trying to win. Because when you're this far ahead, this far out from general election, no wonder they wanted it in May. The risk is, is that gap narrows and narrows. Remember Sunak at party conference, uh, a strategy ditch, but he was trying to present himself as the candidate of change because they realised that this was where the public were. Can the Tories turn it into a referendum on the Labour Party? Do you think that could be a successful in the sense of narrowing the polls tactic? Well, I mean, if in any way this was planned by CCHQ, it would be smart, but it's it's not. Um, it, it's, it's happened and you guys, God love you in the press, have jumped on it. Bless you for perpetuating it and please keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the idea that this was a, a tactic uh, is, is nonsense. However, I mean, I do think that as you get closer to an election, the party of opposition that looks as if it may become the party of government does get more scrutiny and rightly so because it's about to become the, the government of a G7 nation. What's great about this for us in the North uh, as Tories in Scotland is that the SNP are second to us in every seat that we hold and any seats that we believe we could be challengers in, we are second to the SNP. So this idea that it doesn't matter in Scotland if you vote Tory because they're going to lose anyway. It does absolve people if they hate the SNP more than they hate you know, the Tories in government because quite a lot of people cast negative votes. So instead of voting for the person that they want, they vote against the person they hate most <laughs> because everyone's so dissatisfied in politics. And particularly because you've had a government in Westminster from 2010 and a government in Scotland from 2007. You know, it's a long time. Like a lot of people are wanting to boot the party of government where it hurts. So actually the party in Scotland's fairly chipper about, about all of this kind of narrative as well because... On the night, and and I know I'm biased, but on the night, Scotland will be a story. It will be one of the threads of what happens. But also, just before we move on, this fascinated me. Someone told me about this the other day because, you know, you were talking about um, tactical voting, also swing voting. So apparently, I love this little factoid, you know, Labour saying, oh, a war against complacency. We might be 20 points ahead, but anything can happen. It's not 99% nailed on. But then if you look to 1996, right, Labour were like massively ahead before the Blair landslide. But apparently in 1997, 70% of voters never changed their party. So they never switched. And that number's now down to about 30%. So there has been this sort of growth of swing voters over the past 20 years. So basically that sort of adds to this unpredictability And apparently as well, your parents can be traditional voters or swing voters. But if you swing, apparently your kids always swing. So the pool of voters, swinging voters is expanding. I love that. I definitely see it with the younger generation. If there's much less surety, uh, there's much less tribalism. And do you know what? I am delighted. I am delighted that more people are swing voters. I hate the idea of a safe seat. I hate the idea that one sort of demographic, whether it's your race, whether it's the sort of place you live in, whether it's your age, your gender, means that you vote one way. And that was for many, 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 many years the case in, in like you say, 70% of cases. I am deli- I think it serves politics better that everybody's gone a bit slutty. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Let's stop for a minute and then we're going to come back and talk about Angie Rayner and whether the claims about her tax affairs will change anything just before an election. Right, we're back and we wanted to talk to you about Angela Rayner. Now, this is complicated. There's questions about whether she paid the right amount of tax when she sold her council house nearly a decade ago before she became an MP. If it wasn't her main residence, she should have paid capital gains tax on her £48,000 profit 
probably tax totaling around fifteen hundred to two thousand pounds. Now, the Mail on Sunday had another go at this over the weekend. They went deep onto her social media, comparing cushion covers and all sorts to work out where she'd been living. She said she got legal advice, no rules were broken, but she's not making that advice public. She's had Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves both coming in uh, to support her, although Keir Starmer has said he hasn't personally seen the advice, although his team is satisfied. It's not a problem that's going away. And uh, there is this label that the Conservatives are trying to stick on her, which is tax dodger. Look, Jess, how much of a problem is it for Labour and, and for Angie individually, do you think? I do think it is damaging her. I don't think it's catching fire particularly. And, and one of the reasons why is that most ordinary people don't know what capital gains tax is. I think the Tories have massively overestimated the number of people in places like where I live who do a tax return. Like, <laughs> that's not a thing. There isn't like a culture of doing a tax return where I live because most people are PAYE. And you don't ever have to do that. And certainly people don't know about multiple house capital gains tax. The only time this sort of ever really features in the lives of the people I represent is it is inheritance, where obviously it's a different tax regime. So they just aren't aware of this thing. There will be lots and lots and lots of people who have blended families who end up with two properties. But you're talking about tiny minorities of people. And, and if Angela Rona does have the tax to pay then I'm, I'm sure she would just pay it. I think one of the reasons that the Tories have tried to go hard on this is, is one, because you guys haven't had the kind of levels of scrutiny for a long time. And, and this is a, a good opportunity to try and flex those muscles. But also because Angela Rayner particularly has been used as an attack dog from the party. She also said that not even a politician, but like the prime minister's wife, that Mrs Sunak, Ashtaka Murthy, had to publish her tax returns in full and was demanding that. And she's often the name that's used on the Labour press release, demanding people publish their tax returns for transparency and there is a little bit of well do you know what what's good for the goose is good for the gander love like you know if you're going to dish it out like let's see how you cope with taking it so I, I think there is a little bit of that going on there but again the problem with this not catching fire is that it's very complicated and it's not stuff that people touch and feel every day and they, they, they therefore don't necessarily get it you know you're both saying it's not catching fire the question is uh, whether it eventually burns itself out, Ruth. And and the reason I say that is that how do they put it to bed? You know, I went to the local elections launch with Keir Starmer and Angie Rayner. That morning, the Times had uh, published an article saying that the police were considering whether uh, to look at this again. That was enough for it to then go back up the headlines. This interests me because it reminds me a bit of the beer gate Uh, scandal. You'll remember that Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner accused of the son of breaking COVID rules in April 2021. Do you remember they were at a work event, they'd been campaigning, it was in Durham. They were later cleared by the police, but the person that kind of drove that whole story and issue, uh, and it made massive, massive headlines, was Rich Holden, who's the MP up there, who's now the Conservative Party chair. And you can see a kind of version of this in terms of Angela Rayner and the way in which the allegations come out. Rayner denies them. Uh, The police are asked to look at it. Uh, Then, you know, questions of other authorities to look into it. So they they keep the story going. But to be fair, that is politics, right? Angela Rayner is a massive figure in the Labour Party Uh, She has been an attack dog and that they see a chink here and they are just going to keep pressing the wound. You know, if you talk to those around her, they would argue she's done nothing wrong. She sought the tax advice. This will burn itself out because she will be exonerated. But in a campaign, what if the Tories just want to use it as a as a mechanism to go at Labour and disrupt stuff and and disrupt her campaigning. I mean, she's got to be vulnerable to that, hasn't she, Jess? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But that that is politics. Like expecting your opposition to 
try anything to distract and things. And actually, the distraction keeps her from being uh, attacking them. So it, you know, it, it, in some ways, it, it worked. And I think the beer gate thing, I think that the public saw through it and just was like, oh, God, will they stop going on about it, actually? And I think that this, the same will happen with this. And actually, they are at risk when attacking somebody like Angela Rayner of having people accuse them of attacking both a northern working class woman which i don't i don't i think she deserves scrutiny as much as anybody else but it if it starts to look like picking on her it has a counter effect people frequently mistake me and angela rayner for each other <laughs> Uh, I think it's just boobs and common uh, are the two things that you, boobs, women and commonness unite us. I am not a flamehead siren, as you can see. My shoes are very boring, unlike hers. I was on the tube recently and I, I was talking to this Cockney fella who'd sat next to me and he obviously thought I was Angela Rayner. Uh, and he said to me, you're our queen, keep going. And there is a view of a lot of people that Angela Rayner, you know, she reaches bits of the public that um, others can't reach. I think the point that Jess is making is right if it tips over and seems as if it's being it's picking on her particularly. However, what I don't accept is that the defence that people like Rachel Reeves have put up is that this is just the Tories picking on somebody because they're common. I do think that there is a, a worry that you haven't shut it down and it's that Alistair Campbell thing. If you don't shut a story down within five days, then you know that that's your window. So I, I think that there is a, a bit of urgency to get it shut down it might fizzle out but also i wonder actually how much keir starmer's really worried about if she goes or not because she is like you say she does reach parts of the party that he can't reach which can be useful in a john prescott style way and and i thought that blair always used prescott really well for that but but they've had clashes in the past that he's lost and i'm i I don't know him well enough to know how cool he is with that I think that his and her relationship on a personal level is good. I wouldn't compare the sort of institution of it or the the, the way that um, it is used by the party as being anywhere close to as well as it was done by Blair and Prescott yet. Maybe that was about to sort of ramp up. But Jess, you say that um, the personal relationship with Starmer and Rayner is now good. It's fair to say it wasn't always. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, They've been on a journey. Oh, yeah, yeah, I I think that's probably true. Although uh, they've never, ever uh, acted in any bitterness towards each other publicly, uh, even publicly in front of us, the Parliamentary Labour Party. I think that, you know, maybe their offices definitely clash, but they get on better than I think is is reported. But that said, I don't know uh, how much the other thinks that the other is an asset to them. And I, I don't think that the public would consider that, they are a sort of pair of assets yet. Again, I I worry that we wrongly remember the 97 election as being all brilliant and everything. But actually what we you do remember in the early years of Blair, certainly, was that there was a team dynamic, even though he was, you know, this sort of shiny star, there was this team dynamic. And and, and I would hope to see that again. But I, I, I don't think we're there yet. Just to finish off, going back to what you were saying, Ruth, about the John Prescott analogy... This guy, Tom Hamilton, who does social policy at Public First, it's a consultancy, he was a former Labour staffer. I was reading something he said about Angela Rayner the other day where a lot of supporter attack literature for the Tories features Angie, i.e. Conservative voters seem to dislike her, but the wider public don't. And and they've done some focus groups, uh, this Public First have done focus groups and and, and voters talk positively and unprompted about her, saying they like this straightforward, honest manner. So I guess what what this could be, going back to what you said, Ruth, about her being weakened, is that if she is a sort of serious weapon that the Labour Party have to appeal to wider voters and also galvanise the base against her, if you like, then if they could just put Angie Rayner, the firebrand, as you put it, in the corner, that's a win. Yeah, there is a purpose to man-marking her off the pitch. But I also think that we might be overstating the nature of that purpose and its impact because actually the leaders become much more to the fore when it becomes an election campaign because that's who's doing the tele-debates and all that sort of thing. Like you say, people always 
have their own views about strong women. Now, if you like her, she is your Cockney guy's queen. She is the one that's speaking truth to power and she's, you know, she's dragged herself up by her bootstraps and she's exactly, and she's sticking it to all these posh boys. Or she's this brash, brassy woman that actually, you you know, you don't want, you know, you, you've had a bar of and you can't stand her. I mean, she'll be a Marmite politician for the whole of her career because of the strength of her character. But to be honest, I also think that the public are tired of personality politics and they actually just want the parties to say in an election, campaign. This is what we're going to do and this is why we're going to do it. And they're going to be so disappointed because that's not what this campaign's going to be. Yeah, and this one particularly when there's a potential for the handover of power, if you like, after such amount of time, it's going to be a really really nasty fight. And I'm not sure if it will burn itself out because I think that the Tories now think they've got a kind of stick to beat Labour with and and they they are looking to weaponise this. But, but let's see. And may, maybe in the end Angela Rayner will have to do some sort of interview or show someone the advice and and try and shut it down. And I'm always available for that interview, uh, (laughs) if you're listening. Well, look, let's move on. Let's do an email which has come to electoraldysfunction at sky.uk. We always want your emails, so keep them coming. Now, quite a few people said nice things about the conversation we had about trans people in the last episode and the need for calm conversation. We had an email from someone who said they'd been a victim of male violence. This person said, I'm very aware how important it is to safeguard female only services. And they added, I also have close friends who are trans and I want their lives to be easier and their healthcare needs and social needs to be met. Now we're coming back to this because of the report from paediatrician Dr. Hilary Cass. It was commissioned by the NHS England in 2020 and it looked at gender identity services for under 18s. It found there is remarkably weak evidence to support medical gender treatments for children. Now, Ruth, you wanted to talk about this. You see it as a big moment. Yeah, I do. And the reason that I see it in quite a big moment is because there's an opportunity here that could be taken by both parties to start to take some of the heat out of this issue. And I think there is a recognition on both sides that that we need to do a bit of that. And, and I think it's helped that the report is only into the kind of medical treatment of children. So this isn't about sort of adult transitioners or, or anything like that. And, and and I think that's been helpful. And I also think that Wes Streeting, the, the Labour health spokesman's uh, response has been pretty measured. Also, in the, in the government's defence, there was a, a transitional report that came out a couple of years ago that made some recommendations, uh, which was to shut the GIDS clinic at Tavistock and to run that down, and, and that closed a couple of months ago, and to set up regional centres, eight regional centres. So two are already up and running at Great Ormond Street and at Alder Hay in Liverpool, uh, and the other six are, are kind of on their way. So there there, there has actually been movement, and quite often the, the complaint with governments is that you get a report and you never act on it or it takes so long. So that there is actually movement here. And there is the opportunity to look at how we treat kids. And, and Dr. Cass's work is that it shouldn't just be a rush to puberty blockers. It should be about holistic treatment. It's not just about the numbers of kids that are coming forward. It's also about the amount of issues we have around mental health services, particularly because that's a huge part of this holistic treatment. And if we don't have the people to help this report can only go so far. So I think it's a massive opportunity, but it needs to be resourced in order to make it happen. We all agree, I think, that the the sort of culture war or the spikiness of, like, Rishi Sunak mentioning, you know, what's a woman sort of thing, and sometimes the Labour Party's lack of clarity over it over the years has been unedifying. But I have to say, without some pretty fierce mums largely and um, activists highlighting the issue, the cast review would never have happened. So whilst nobody wants a culture war, I think that the the women who spoke up about this particular issue, who in lots of cases, and it says this in the cast review, uh, and even doctors who tried to speak up were vilified for speaking up because of the environment that had been created that we, you know, we do really owe a, a debt of gratitude to quite a lot of people who who sort of basically said, "Don't, don't let this be silenced. Let's look at it." But also a bit of credit to Sajid Javid, who was the health minister at the time, that could have set up this in any way that he wanted to. He could have wanted like a quick win and set it up for six months or whatever. But he worked pretty hard 
to give Hillary, to, one, to find Hillary Cass to do it and to give her the parameters to do this in a way that is actually a really chunky piece of work and that has taken an awful lot of one science, but but also a lot of testimony from people that have been through this without kind of fear or favour. And that's why you've got organisations like Mermaids, like Stonewall, who ha- have been pretty tempered in, in the way in which they've responded to it, in the same way the people that have responded to it from a political sense, by and large, have been pretty responsible. There are others who haven't, and we've seen some of the social media stuff. But, but the way in which this has been conducted is a bit of a template of how you can do really sensitive things. And we don't often praise people. We quite often point out where people have made mistakes. Well... That was, again, a very interesting discussion. Keep those emails coming. We're very happy uh, to talk about these issues with more light than heat. And the voicemails. I love the voicemails. Send us voice notes. I like hearing from you. I like accents. Ruth, what are you doing this weekend? I am having a hugely exciting weekend in that I'm going into hospital for some surgery. Yay! Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah. So the next time you see me, if if you watch this rather than listen to it, uh, I'll be all strapped up. So for the next six weeks, I'm I'm going to have no use of my right arm. I won't be able to drive. I won't be able to, like, do up my own clothes. I've, I've gone on to Amazon and I've bought myself a knife fork spoon so I can cut up my food my wife is going to be uh, yeah I've got a spork so my wife is going to be delighted about how much she's going to have to do for me I am a terrible patient Mm. so yeah like when I'm messaging you I'm just going to be like furious that I'm having to type left handed one handed and use a left handed mouse and stuff like that awful Jess what are you doing I'm mainly door knocking because we're leading into elections aren't we so I'll be out uh, campaigning in my seat but also my mates are coming over Uh, my, my friend Catherine she's allergic to wheat and my husband promised to make her ham, egg and chips for dinner Oh, nice! about two and a half years ago. And because our diaries are so ridiculous, uh, we are finally having a, a, a very long ago promised ham, egg and chips with lots of cocktails. Your husband sounds like a keeper. I was going to say something about his nether regions then, but he wouldn't <laughs> thank me. Don't, don't, don't show us a picture. I don't have any pictures because we're normal human beings. <laughs> Beth, what are you doing this weekend? I'm I'm not doing anything. I'm recovering from Centre Parks. I'm going to go and see my dear friend Laura and hang out with her. I'll be making my way back to Westminster for next week. A new parliamentary term begins. Now, if you want setting up for that new political term, don't forget Jack and Sam with their predictions for the week ahead. Politics at Jack and Sam's with Jack Blanchard and Sam Coates in your feed on Sunday evening. Uh, the Rwanda bill is coming back next week, so we are going to be busy, busy, busy. And remember, you can WhatsApp voice note us on, get your pens ready, 07934 or send an email at electoraldysfunction at sky.uk. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed it, tell your mates, and we'll be back next week. Bye. 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 Bye.